The Art of Raising Capital. That's today's episode. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris. I'm the founder of Morris Invest and rehab thousands of homes, longtime real estate investor, and I'm honored. It's my deep honor today on the Investing in Real Estate show to have one of the legends in raising capital, one of the rich dad advisors, Darren Weeks, on the show today. He's the best-selling author of The Art of Raising Capital, thus the title of today's episode. Follow along, kids. He's the CEO of Fast Track Group in Canada and one of the eight Rich Dad advisors to Robert Kiyosaki. I think we've had the entire Rich Dad team here on the podcast, and I'm so excited to finally get Darren here on the show. Darren, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for the opportunity, Clayton. Oh, it's my honor. And the last time we tried to talk, I think you were in what Paraguay, Morocco, Argentina, yeah, Par- or something. Paraguay and didn't seem to work very well with the internet connection. So I appreciate your patience. No, but you're a world traveler. I think you were there with Robert Kiyosaki at the time. And what were you doing? Right. You were, obviously you got the brand new book out. But what were you guys doing in Paraguay? Well, we have a good friend named Fernando Gonzalez, and he kind of takes care of Latin America. And he's been a friend of Robert's and mine for probably 20 years. So we were doing an event in Paraguay, a two-day event. And then we, we had some time off to go you know, sightseeing and, and see the world a bit. And then we went to Argentina, to Buenos Aires for the first time for me, to also do another two-day event there. And, you know, I always learned so much from Robert. Uh, I've probably heard him speak, you know, a couple hundred days in my life. But I just always learned so much from him. And we did it as a team with Fernando, myself, uh, Andy Andy and Garrett, two other rich advisors, were also on the trip, as well as Kim Kiyosaki. So it was a great trip, lots of learning. And I want to make a quick comment. You know, the one thing that Robert talked about was real teachers and fake teachers. And I'm from Canada, but obviously I watch the news. And, you know, you've got the real news and fake news. And I just want to say congratulations to those for listening, because, Clayton, you are a real teacher. Like, you're doing it. And I just want to say congratulations, because it's rare to have somebody you know, on, on TV and in media that actually is doing it. So congratulations to you. And uh, Robert really appreciates that you're a real teacher. Well, I really appreciate that. And it's very kind of you to say, and that's why I honestly am attracted to yourself and the whole team from the Rich Dad Advisory Group. I mean, yourself from having done 4,000 rental properties and amassing this massive portfolio, being the guy that Robert Kiyosaki turns to to help him raise capital for deals, it's right there. Tom Wheelwright, our tax advisor at ProVision, right. who's a genius right. when it comes to tax uh, accounting for real estate investing. Garrett Sutton on the legal side. I mean, you know, yeah. Ken McElroy on the real estate yeah. side. You guys are walking the walk every day. So this isn't fluff. This isn't BS. Right. You guys are actually in the trenches doing this stuff. Agreed. So that's what Robert, you know, kept saying is we're not just up there, you know, trying to sell a seminar or something. We don't sell anything at the events. And we just want to teach people or real teachers doing the real thing. And, um, you know, so anything you want to ask me, I'm going to tell people this is what I did. My hands got dirty doing it. And I've got, you know, I hate to admit how many years experience I'm getting older. I got a lot of experience doing this. So I'm happy to help if I can. Is it difficult to reflect on those first few deals to walk me back to the beginning? Because as you know, I look at expanding our company and I look expanding and getting creative with financing and trying to pull in different sources of financing and crowdfunding, all these different things. It can be intimidating and scary. Walk me back to those first few deals you did the mistakes you made, um, and some of the scaffolding that you put in place, which is which is now informed what you currently do. And I'm really proud to look back, actually, and, and I did recap a little bit about that in Argentina. I don't look back that often. So before I ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, when I was young, I knew that rich people typically own real estates and businesses. So I bought my first property in 1990, and I was a university student. And I'm proud to say I still own that property 27 years later. So after I had about 10 properties under my belts, I ran into the same problem that most entrepreneurs run into. And one is I didn't have any more money and there was no way the banks would give me any more mortgages because my debt service ratios were were not any good anymore for them, for their risk profile. So I actually started going to trade shows. I thought, who can I start meeting that could be my potential investor that would want to own real estate in their portfolio, but probably wouldn't want to get their hands dirty and do all the hard work? So I thought about doctors and I thought, well, I can never get in front of them. They're always working. So then I thought, you know what? Teachers, they always go to conventions. So I started going to teacher conventions and that's where I made all my mistakes, actually. But I'm happy I made them. So I'd go to teacher conventions. I'd have a small booth set up and, you know, I'd have a free uh, draw box and gold, you know, wrapping paper on the, on the tables because teachers are so cheap. They like free things. And then I'd have a Hershey kiss of uh, Hershey bowl kisses on the table. And if a couple of girls walked by, I'd say, hey, girls, would you like a kiss? And, you know, people would come over and you start just talking. 
And that's how it all started. And it made lots of mistakes. And then after a couple of years of, you know, getting some investors, but not tons, then I went to dentist conventions. And I just felt that that scaffolding, as you mentioned, it was stronger. I made fewer mistakes. And I said on stage the other day, and Robert got a kick out of it, I made all my mistakes with teachers. I made all my money with dentists. So, <laughs> so going back, that's how I started doing it. Just going to these different trade shows, sponsored golf tournaments, meeting, meeting people that had money. So, and tell me when you would have those conversations, the difference in the conversation that you would have from the teacher to the dentist. Pretend I'm a teacher walking up to your table trying to grab some of these Hershey's kisses. What would that look like? Well, a lot more skeptical. Um, you know, they would never talk about more than one property at a time. You know, so financially it was, it was more questions around finances. Um, but I, I will say two things were consistent throughout. One, everybody seems to want to own real estate in their portfolio. They, they know it's an asset class. Sub, is that the word? Subtuitively? Um, they know it's an asset class, but they don't know how to get it. So they all want it in their portfolio. Um, but with, with the dentist, it was like, okay, instead of buying one, can we buy four? They make quicker decisions, right. I guess, because, you know, hundred grand to them was as, mu was as much as, say, 25000 was to a teacher. Right. So we that's kind of some of the differences. We work with a lot of doctors, and they're like, I don't want just one pro – I, I, I need to do 10 right now. <laughs> it's like, okay, hold on there. You know, we'll, we'll – Exactly. Try, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. but how would you present – take me through some of the mechanics of actually talking to these individuals. You know, when they come up to your table – Hi, I'm Darren, yeah. and I sell real estate. I've got the ability to raise capital. Uh, how do you how do you talk to these guys? Well, actually, great question. Again, people are listening. Um, first of all, to make sure you make your mistakes with people that only have enough money for one. You don't want to make mistakes with you know. But it wasn't that I was ever selling anybody an investment at the booth. All we're trying is to get people to like you and trust you, and then get their information for a further meeting. So it kind of goes, the way I look at it is, you know, you got a 30 second pitch. And the reason it's 30 seconds is that's how long it takes to either have a Hershey kiss. So my name's Darren Weeks. Just wanted to let you know, as you can see this, this booth, I'm a real estate investor. I'm a professional real estate investor. My team and I, for the last you know, number of years, have bought apartment buildings in Canada's hottest marketplaces. And what we do is we allow individual investors who want real estate in their portfolio to participate in cash flowing deals. And we typically work with people that are tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, tired of not getting the returns they, they wish, and, and tired of not getting cash flow. So does that sound, Clayton, of, of any interest to you? Would you want me to give you any more information? Oh, I'd love and that. That's kind of the yeah. icebreaker, right? Right. You now, the next key for me is, and I, I should have brought a sample, and it does date myself, but all I would want to do is get to see if you know they were interested. And if they were, I wouldn't try to go, go any further and try to explain the concept because it would take an hour. So I actually created a cassette tape. It was professionally recorded. It was actually four people on a golf course and just talking about the real estate program that I created. So I would say, you know, Clayton, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. There's lots of pieces if you want to get involved in this. And, you know, you're busy, I'm busy. You know, you might have a spouse that would also want to be interested, educated in this too. So I've created this cassette tape. Tell you what, I'll give you this and I'll call you in a week. And then you can determine if you're interested or not. And if you're not, no hard feelings. You know, I never, ever high pressure anybody. So, Clayton, would you like the tape? Of course, they would say yes. I'd say, well, the only condition I have is I need to get your phone number so I can call you in a week. And that was really important. If they don't want to give me their phone number, then they're really not interested. Right. So I just say, thanks for coming anyway, and then move on, right? Right. If I did get the tape to them and I got their phone number, then a week later, it's now what I would call dialing for dollars. So I would phone every teacher or every dentist. And if you get a hold of somebody, you know, 95% didn't listen to the tape yet. So then you say, hey, can I call back next week if they're still interested? And just go through the process of, you know, dialing for dollars. And then I would try to set up a one-hour meeting if they're interested because they already listened to the tape. So I kind of systemized it so I didn't have to repeat myself, you know, 100 times. That's great. That's how I started. That's great. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's amazing. And to think that these people could – you know, there's no education for real estate investing out there. And at that time, it's incredibly difficult right. to find it. They understand, to your point, that they know they want to be involved in real estate. They're just not sure how. Right. The idea of raising capital. So at the time, you were doing what with real estate? You were you were trying to put these deals together, but you needed the teacher's money in order to get these projects off the ground. Is that the mechanics of what you needed? Absolutely. So we would we would close on a property, say, in six months. So we'd have to raise the equity. 
So we'd have six months to raise the equity. So the for people listening, there's equity, which is down payment, and then the bank's going to give us the debt. So we were trying to raise the equity with these investors. And in exchange for that, they would actually own one of the apartment buildings. We turn it into a condo. They'd own one, have, have their name on the title. So once the bank saw that we had enough sold, pre-sold, then they'd give us the debt. Then we would basically close on the building. Great. So then you close on the building. Now this investor, this teacher who might not otherwise have had any access to real estate investing now owns a piece of this with a good percentage return on their investment instead of the 1% or 2% Bingo. of the stock market. They're getting Perfect. a great return. And you've handled all of the heavy lifting for them. Right. We handled all the heavy lifting. And, you know, it's, it's divide and conquer. When you buy a 150-unit apartment building per door, I mean, the costs were 50, let's say. Put 10 or 15 into renovations, sell to them for 80, make a little bit of profit. Um, but the cash flow is really good because $80,000 a door, you're going to get some pretty good rent for that. And they would get the rent. We put them into a rent pool. So there wasn't really much risk if your place was empty and we'd manage it for them. So it was total hands off. And the concept we used to have, we called it a virtual apartment building. So you could own, and again, I'm a Canadian. Most of our deals were in Canada. You'd own one in Vancouver, one in Edmonton, one in Calgary, one in Ottawa. We did have some projects in Phoenix as well. So you'd own different areas because every market had different fundamentals. So we'd study those very, very well, by the way. And we, we made our clients very happy, made them a lot of money. So when if someone's just starting, obviously you've written a book about the art of raising capital. If someone's just getting started and they know they want to get involved in real estate investing, but they don't have the capital, where do you tell newbies, when you're up on stage, where do you tell newbies to look to get started? Take me through some of those steps for people to get started with raising capital. Well, the first thing I suggest is if you want somebody to invest with you, it's, it's pretty hard if you don't have experience. You know, so if I'm going to talk to you and say, hey, you should give me some money so I can buy some property for us. If you don't have a track record, that makes it almost impossible outside of your mom and dad maybe having some sympathy. Right. So what I always suggest is go find somebody who has, you know, five or ten properties and just work for free. Just hang out in the environment and then maybe even exchange some services after you worked for free and you got six months under your belt. So maybe I'm good at painting. So I'd say to somebody like you, Clayton, or somebody with less experience, you know what? Tell you what, I'll paint this property and I'll, I'll fix the landscaping and maybe I own 5% of this for my sweat equity. So even if you own 5% of a property, now you can say I own a property. Right. You know. So get a couple of those under your belt. Then it's a much easier story to then say to Clayton, you know what, Clayton, you know, my team and I who have over 25 years experience, we own 25 properties. And, and you're not lying. Even though you only own pieces of two, you're not lying. It's your team and you and your experience. So at least now you've got some experience and you can talk with, with authority and truth. Like you actually got your hands dirty, have some real experience. So you also learn the vocabulary of real estate and, and investing. That's great. And then you're able to go and maybe you stumble across a, a five package of properties or a 10 package of properties mm -hmm. that come to your door. You're able to go now to investors, whether it's with a, a lemonade stand in front of teachers sure. and start, you know, saying, sure. look, I've got 10 properties. They cash flow this. Would you like to be an right. investor pull, pulling our money? You'll own a piece of that. Now for the teacher, I'm curious on the teacher side, if they're, or even that guy who's doing the landscaping for, for free, he's mm -hmm. getting 5% of that deal. Talk about like sort of the tax implications or where that looks for them. Are they able to claim sort of on their balance sheet that they're now a real estate investor in this hundred thousand dollar property, or are they a five thousand or a five percent owner on their balance sheet? How does that stuff shake out? Well, again, I'll have to say you should get professional advice from Tom Wilwright as an example. Right. And the rules in Canada are probably different in the United States or wherever your listeners are from. But in Canada, we have a specific area that says what percentage do you own of the property? So you'd put five or 10 or whatever, and then you'd, you'd have the corresponding write-offs. So you still get some tax benefits. But the, the vast majority, I mean, the most important thing is you can now literally say to people, I own a property. But more importantly, you actually have experience. And right. that's really the key is how do you get experience? Well, work for free. You know, take some courses, of course, get educated. That's smart. But bottom line is work for free, get your hands dirty. And that's, I think, the best way to get uh, true experience. So when you talked about you know, that side of it, the raising of capital. Take me through sort of a Robert Kiyosaki capital raising experiment. Robert calls you for the first time. How did you meet Robert? How did you put your first deal together with Robert? Well, to be honest with you, Robert and I don't raise capital for each other. Or I don't raise capital for him. 
And the beautiful thing about Robert is when he does events, again, even in Paraguay and Argentina, he doesn't sell anything. He right. really just loves to teach. So the reason I got involved with this was actually Ken McElroy. Oh. So he's a rich advisor. And at the time, he owned about 4,000 properties. And I met him, you know, as I was a student. I wasn't an advisor yet. This is around 2003. And I said, hey, would you like to come to Canada to speak? I've got a small seminar company. And he came up. So we got to know each other over a couple of years. And then because I had some raising capital experience and him and I were talking and, you know, like we're having a beer in, in Phoenix one time. And he said every time he has to raise capital, he's got to phone, you know, 40 entrepreneurs like Robert Kiyosaki or his NBA basketball players. Again, this is at least 10 years ago. He said it takes so much time. What he really likes to do is to manage the properties and his partner would find them and finance them. But the raising capital part was just a burden. So all I saw, Clayton, was an opportunity. I thought to myself, you know what? In my seminars, everybody wants to buy properties, but they don't. They don't know how to do it. They don't want to get their hands dirty. Don't want to deal with tenants. Right. So I just put these two parties together. I said, okay, Ken, when you need $5 million, how about I just give you one check? He goes, that'd be awesome. I right. so much time. <laughs> so then in Canada, everybody wants to invest in Ken McElroy deals because his experience returned, but they couldn't because they didn't have a quarter million dollars. So I just legally created basically a fund that allowed people to get in for $10,000 as a minimum. So I aggregated three or 400 investors together, got a check for 5 million, gave it to Ken. Now, how did I get paid? I'd say, hey, Ken, if I do all this for you, will you give me, as an example, 10% of the deal? He said, absolutely, because I don't have the time to do this. I would then say to the investors the same thing. If I get you into one of these bigger deals that you would never get into without me as the intermediate, will you give me 10% of the deal? They said yes. So that's that's basically what I did. I raised over $150 million and gave about $100 million to Ken and Ross to buy over 5,000 properties. Wow. And just own a piece in the middle. Mind blown. I'm sure so, so many of our listeners right now, they're just like, all right, I'm just getting started with real estate investing. Holy smokes. So you don't have to be scared, you know, if you're just getting started there, you know, listen to what Darren is saying here and just take those steps, you know, take those simple steps to surround yourself with those people that are doing these big deals and ask to be a part of it, put in that sweat equity, because that's how you're going to really, really learn to take those next steps. So how did that change Ken's business? Well, I think he, well, this is all also back in the perfect time, 2008, 9, 10, 11. It, when everything crashed, we got things on sale and we could because we were like literally very few people in the market with cash, right. flush with cash. So when the financial crisis happened, we were buying as many properties as possible. And for me, the good news was, and this is something else to consider, is I like different currencies. I don't want to have all my money in Canadian dollars. And we bought with Canadian dollars at the time. It was stronger than the U.S. dollar. Now it's the opposite way. In the last couple of years, the average American dollar gets me a dollar thirty Canadian. So we bought at the right time. I bought with a strong currency, and now we're getting paid in U.S. dollars that are really valuable in Canada because our currency has gone down. So I am not going to say that we were geniuses. I think there was some luck involved, but I also say that you can't get lucky if you don't take action. So if the average investor wants to just get capital um, for like one small deal, wants to start putting together some money for that, you know, $50,000 home, that $100,000 home, what would your advice be for that individual? Is it different than the advice about the sweat equity and hanging out with the guy that's doing 10 units at once? I mean, I think that's a good place to start, but it, I think it goes back to the deal. And again, you could probably talk about this more than I could because I haven't done too many smaller deals for a long time. But if you find a deal that is worth, you know, let's say you're buying a house, just round numbers, you're buying a house that's worth 300 grand, but you're picking up for 250 because somebody was divorced, there's a death in a family, there's a million reasons, and you need to put 10 grand into it. If you can show an investor, listen, this thing's appraised at 300 grand, I'm picking up for 260. Let's be honest, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to say that's a good deal. And let's say it's positive cash flow as well. But here's what people don't do. And I was at a luncheon in Paraguay with entrepreneurs, and this one gentleman came to me and said, I really need money. I can't grow. The banks aren't my friends. And I said to him this question, how many people have you asked in the last month to invest in your business? Huh. And Clayton, guess what his answer was? Zero. And it's always zero. Right. So that's the key. I asked the same question in front of 500 people, and 495 people said I asked zero. So if you never ask anybody, you're not going to raise capital either. 
That's I, the key. I did a video series on our YouTube channel, Morris Invest YouTube channel, on the art of raising private money, or not the art of it, mm-hmm. but uh, how to raise private money. And one of the videos, I did a live call where I just got on the phone call with my Rolodex of friends and right. did a live recording. I said, it's going to take you five minutes. Watch this. Sure. You know, and I just jump on and I said, hey, I've got a deal. This this house is worth this much. I'm putting this together. Are you interested? Let's grab coffee. Yeah, I'm absolutely interested. Great. Let's do it next Tuesday. How does that look for you? Perfect. All right, great. I'll see you then. Boom. That's mm-hmm. one guy. He's a doctor. Bingo. Right? Yep. Then you get the second guy. Then you get the third guy. But if you don't pick up the phone, you're not going to make anything Perfect. happen. Perfect. I couldn't agree more. That's the key. So what I did was in order to phone somebody, I went to trade shows because otherwise, again, is who do you phone? Well, you know, go network, go to trade shows, spend some money on marketing, just like any other successful business does. You have to spend money on marketing as well. Yeah. Oh, it's a great point. When you look at, you know, I I love what you say in your book, how the book is positioned in the art of raising capital. So many people sort of skip over that chunk of that step of their story, right? They're telling your story, how I got successful. They're not talking about the art of raising the money because there's people always have a lack of capital. People always always have a lack of capital, but there's so much money out there sitting there waiting for people if they just would actually take those steps and put those things in place to take action. I I couldn't agree more when, you know, this is also a a feather of the cap kind of a story as well. So, you know, I raised all this money. The vast majority were given to Ken and Ross with MC companies. And then a phone call comes in and it's the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line Company. So it's a $6 billion company. And even they were looking for cash and we we did a deal together. We built the largest cruise ship terminal in the world in, in Falmouth, Jamaica. So when you're good at raising capital, I'm telling you, everybody is your friend. Everybody's looking for money. Um, it, it's, it's always very valuable if you're the person that can raise money. And obviously what we do at our company is very similar to that. And I'm always curious about the returns, right? And I'm sure mm-hmm. that's what people are wondering. So when you're putting a deal together, the mechanics of a deal, and if someone's listening right now that wants to put a deal together and raise money, What sorts of returns should their investors be seeking? Should it be 6%, 7%? Is it up to you? Where do you fall in when you're, when you're doing capital raising and the, and the returns that you're going to promise people? Well, you know what I do is I, I, it it depends legally as well, how you put together your paperwork. Cause, cause we were so big, we had to, you know, put down everything when you're smaller or if you're not selling securities and you're having investors invest in real estate, which there also is a difference. There's a huge difference. I would actually do a needs analysis. So Clayton, if I were you sitting down and you were a doctor and you're a potential investor, I wouldn't tell you what kind of returns. I would actually ask you a lot of questions and find out what you were getting in your returns, what you expected, when you wanted to retire, when you needed cash flow or capital gains. And I would structure my answer around what you needed. Brilliant. Because what I've seen is there's a lot of deals that are, you're going to get a 40% return, especially as you get experience like you're getting. I'm sure some of your deals are fantastic. If I am the doctor and I'm happy with eight, then why do I have to say, let's do a 50-50 joint venture, for instance? Right. You know what, Clayton? I think I could get you eight. And I've got some properties in mind, and I'll bring you some pro formas, and I'll show you how we can do that. And if we do really well, I can even give you a bonus of 3%. You might get 11. So I don't I don't ever go into something with, I'm going to give you 12 or 8 or 10. I try to get from them what they need, and then match it with the appropriate property. And I think if your listener gets that gist of that, that could make you tens of thousands or millions of dollars in your career. Oh, that's a brilliant strategy. It really is because, you know, if someone's getting 2% in the stock market, 3% in the stock market, which a lot of people get, well, hey, John, mm-hmm. what if I could double that for you? Perfect. Right? So why do you want to say, hey, we're going to give you 12? Right. 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 So right. I love that strategy. That's great. Okay. Well, well, Darren, uh, what's next for you? Um, obviously, you travel in the world teaching. Um, do you have any other materials, any other books coming out? The Art of Raising Capital for Entrepreneurs and Investors is a huge hit. We're going to have that linked up on our show notes page. I would encourage everyone to go and buy that book and read it. But what's next for you? Well, I sold my seminar company. Actually, I'm just a real entrepreneur. I love sales and marketing, so I'm doing a lot less speaking. You know, that was that was just a passion for a number of years, but. I like challenges, and once I reach them, I want a new challenge. So I've got a few other companies I'm, I'm working on right now. Uh, Black Rifle Coffee is something you'll probably hear about one of these days. I've got the rights to Canada, so we're going to launch that in a few weeks. And I just want companies where I have a great product and I can build a sales team. So I've got you know four or five companies I'm working up, working on up in Canada. I travel a little bit to speak, but that's definitely not you know not my my day to day thing. Um, so life is exciting. I'm still raising capital, but. You know, million dollars minimum is now what I what I look for, um, and anybody can do this. 
keep in mind, I've been doing this, I'm, I'm 49 years old, so I've been doing this for almost 30 years. So with experience, anybody can do it. And in my book or listening to you, all I ever try to do with people is just share with you all my mistakes I've made. Because everybody listen, you can shortcut this process by 25 years, guaranteed. <laughs> You really can. So that's kind of what I'm up to. I love that. That's absolutely right. You can absolutely, if you just pay attention to experts like Darren, you can absolutely shave years off of your mistakes. Don't, you know, yes. and well, my, my laundry list of mistakes over the years as well. So that's sure. great. And by the way, I'm a huge coffee fan. So I, I'm going to send you my address later. I expect. Gotcha. A, uh, I'll send you some black I, ruffle coffee. Send me that address. I would love that. And I'll, oh man, I'm, I'm excited about that. Good okay. for you, Darren. Well, it's been a real treat having you here on the show and uh, it's, really an honor to be able to speak with you. I'm so glad we got to do this. And, uh, you know, I hope all of our listeners had some key takeaways. I, I counted a, a whole note card full of takeaways here for people to be able to go out there and take action immediately on. So Darren, good luck to you. Thank you so much for your time, attention and effort. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clayton. Thanks, Darren. And thanks to all of you for downloading and subscribing to the show. Again, we'll have links to everything that Darren and I talked about on today's episode in the show notes page. Just go over to morrisinvest.com, click on the podcast page, and everything that Darren and I talked about, including uh, links to Darren's book as well, is all there. And then when we get the Black Rifle Coffee, we'll put that on the website as well so you guys can order Perfect. some. Awesome stuff, everyone. We'll see you back here next week with another episode of Investing in Real Estate. Until then, go out there, take action, and shave years of mistakes off your life by reading Darren's book. We'll see you next time, everyone.